Good afternoon. Is everybody awake? I know we just had lunch, so I want to make sure that uh, everybody's ready for our keynote lunch speaker. By show of hands here, how many people were here last year to hear Railroad Commissioner Ryan sit and speak? Let me see your hands. Okay, I'm not surprised that you're back. And for those of you that weren't here last year, you're really in for a treat because he's a dynamic speaker. He's going to tell you more things, that practical things about oil and gas industry that you'll be able to share with your colleagues and everybody think you're the smartest guy on the block. My name is Steve Cody. I'm a risk advisor with Brady Chapman Holland & Associates. I'm also proudly serving the executive board for the Economic Alliance Houston Port Region. And I'm excited about this event. And what I like to say, too, at this point, after a couple of days of this great event, now you're here for the main event. The two big guns are here, and I'm proud to introduce our first one. Ryan Sitton is a native Texan growing up in the Irving area. He's a graduate of Texas A&M. Figured I'd get that. He earned a degree in mechanical engineering and met his beautiful wife, Jennifer, there. Ryan was arrested in, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I have to mark that off. Yeah, that was, that was my mistake. Following college, Ryan began his career as an engineer in the energy industry. In 2006, Ryan and Jennifer founded a company called Pinnacle ART. It's an engineering and technology company focused on reliability and integrity programs for the oil and gas, petrochemical, mining, pharmaceutical, and wastewater industries. So he knows a little bit about all that. Ryan was elected to the Texas Railroad Commission on November 4th, 2014. Commissioner Sinton won the general election with almost 60% of the vote, which is pretty impressive. As a railroad commissioner, Ryan is working to make the commission more efficient, effective, so Texas can lead America to energy independence. Ryan and his wife, uh, Jennifer, have three children, and get this, they have an impressive collection of over 100,000 Legos. So obviously we know he's raising more engineers there at the house. He is deeply honored to serve as your railroad commissioner. He's excited to serve the people of Texas. Without no further ado, Commissioner Ryan Sitton. Thank you. Good afternoon. I was actually sharing with the people at my lunch table that I give a lot of speeches these days because as you can imagine, so much is going on in the oil and gas business and being the primary regulator for oil and gas in this state, people always want to know what's going on. And I have gotten very comfortable speaking. And as I was coming in today, from the time I walked into the door to sit down at the lunch table, come over here, listen to the introduction and watch the show of hands, I'm reminded that there were a lot of people here last year and I keep getting this feeling like, wow, I've only got down to go from last year. I really should have prepared some new material. No, I'm just kidding. I've got some new things to talk about. Last year when I talked to you, we spent some time talking a lot of geek stuff. I went through some numbers on production levels and global inventories. I talked a lot about where the market was heading, everything from oil and gas production to downstream. And we're going to come back to some of those things. But I want to start off with a little history lesson. December 7th, 1941. All of us know that day in history. At 7.48 in the morning, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. Most of us remember at some point in our young history classes when we first heard this story. I remember I was a third grader at Holy Family of Nazareth Parish in Irving when Miss Swaylock read a passage that was written firsthand account by a survivor of Pearl Harbor. To a young third grader, this leaves a lasting impression. Let me share with you some of the numbers about that day. Japan brought six aircraft carriers, two battleships, four destroyers, 23 submarines, and 414 aircraft to attack Pearl Harbor. The Americans, not expecting the attack, would lose 2,403 lives and another 1,100 would be injured. Now, if you remember in history what was happening at the time was America was trying desperately hard to stay out of World War II. Having gone through and survived World War I, <clears throat> most of the population of this country feared 
with due purpose, another global military conflict. So we had tried very hard to stay out of this war. And after that attack, America declared war on Japan. And in response, Germany and Italy declared war on the United States. We were in World War II. And one of the famous lines coming out of this battle that you'll hear echoed in the history books is the admiral leading the Japanese Navy fleet who made the statement, I fear that we have awoken a sleeping giant. And obviously that would come to bear as America would join the Allied powers and eventually be victorious in World War II. But if you think back to what happened that day in Pearl Harbor, the question that many historians will ask is, why would Japan make that move? It was obviously a strategic mistake to attack America with such ferocity that we would have no choice but to enter the war. Why would they make that move? At the time Japan entered World War II, they had finished a project over the course of the prior 20 years converting their entire naval fleet from coal-powered vessels to oil-powered vessels. Japan has no oil and gas natural reserves. December 7th, 1941, Japan, having fueled its military agenda for, at this point, a couple of years, was down to 20 days of oil. We were not going to have to fire a shot. Japan was going to lose World War II simply by running out of gas. Knowing this was coming, Japan had set their sights on Malaysia. If you go down the Pacific coast of Asia, <clears throat> to where Malaysia is. Malaysia and today the country and its national oil company are called Petronas, have some of the largest oil fields in that hemisphere. And Japan knew if they could capture the Malaysian oil fields and utilize the, in, the existing refining infrastructure, Japan could take that energy, that oil, that gas, pull it up along the coastline and continue to power their naval fleet. But they knew if they went into Malaysia, Americans wouldn't really have to enter the war. All we would have to do would be to blockade the supply lines, carrying oil and gas from Malaysia up to Japan. And once again, Japan would lose the war by running out of gas. Japan made the move to go into Pearl Harbor December 7th, 1941, not just to preemptively attack the United States, but to prevent us from limiting their ability to get their hands on that oil. Japan went into Malaysia within four hours of attacking Pearl Harbor. And they were successful in capturing those fields. This is one of many snippets in history that we can look at. You can talk about the military conflict in Kuwait when Saddam Hussein tried to capture those oil fields. Another lesson from more recent history. I talked about it last year. Russia selling natural gas into Europe making billions of dollars a day and now talking about annexing Crimea and the Ukraine by, and doing so by capturing the pipelines in the area. Time and time again, history reminds us, he who controls the energy controls the world. In the United States, we have been very blessed with not just natural resources, but with, cap but with the entrepreneurial spirit that we have, coupled with technology, innovation, Capitalism and the free market have continuously had a major presence in the international energy markets. And as I talked last year, we are shifting back again after 50 years on the, de on the decline. Over the last 10, we are shifting back into a position of leadership. And it's very exciting. But of course, the short term has been somewhat challenging. I want to talk about three predictions I made for those who took notes last year. Anyone? No? Okay. Last year... I said three things. First, I said we would experience some low oil prices. I said, I think we'll be below $50 a barrel. I said this last year, all the way through this year, 2016. I also said that we would lift the crude oil export ban. And I also said that the downstream segments of the market, refining and petrochemical, would continue to be strong. Of my three predictions, two of them are correct. One of them is delayed. And we're going to talk about that. But before I talk about all those statistics, I want to shift gears a little bit from last year and talk about why this is important today. Today, as I talk to you, I'm actually going to talk a little bit more politics than I normally do 
Because now when I mention this idea that he who controls the energy controls the world, now I think we in Texas are called on to be leaders like we have not in a generation. I'm going to get back to that as we go through some of these details. So let me talk about these three predictions. The first one was crude oil prices, that they were going to stay low through this year, i.e. under $50 a barrel. But I also said that when they started to come back, they would come back well. Well, so far my prediction has played out. We were oversupplied by about a million and a half to two million barrels a day in 2014. That led to high inventories around the world and it's led to depressed oil prices. Now, one thing I love about the people in the oil, I go up to anybody here from Midland, Texas? The Midlanders born and raised, no? Okay, great, I can make all this up. No one will know if I'm lying. In Midland, the independent oil guy is not just the lifeblood of their local economy. It is the everything of their economy. It's really a neat place to visit. And one thing I love about the local oil guy, the independent oil guy, is, man, he is, he is the hardest working guy you'll ever meet. <clears throat> he is committed to going out and doing whatever he has to do to be successful, roll up his sleeves, get into the mud, drill the holes, complete them, deal with the financials, whatever he's got to do. But I also love the fact that Man, they, they can be an emotional group. And I have had this conversation over the last year and a half that I find really interesting. About a year and a half ago, I was telling people, you know, um, like this, we had just begun to experience this little dip in oil prices. At the end of 2014, OPEC's putting more oil on the market, prices going down. And I have this conversation. I say, look, you know what, um, as I'm studying it, oil prices are probably going to continue to trend down because we've got a lot of oversupply. And the independent oil guy says, Oh, Ryan, you don't understand. We're in a new normal, which I still don't know what that means. We're in a new normal. Oil demand is going up around the world. Oil prices are going to be high for a long time. Oh, okay. Sure enough, I was right. We were oversupplied. Oil prices are coming down. Now I go to him and I say, but hey, I've got some good news. I've got good news because the price, the, the production and consumption lines are closing. We see a lot of economic indicators to pull prices up. And you know what they tell me? Ryan, you don't understand. We're in a new normal. We're oversupplied. People are pumping too much oil on the market. So luckily, the gigantic dork geek analyst statistics guy in me comes out and I say, let me give you a couple of indicators. Last year, I told you, and this was, this was accurate, we were between a million and a half and two million barrels oversupplied in the market. Between last year at this time and now, between the United States and Venezuela alone, a million and a half barrels of production are off the market. Just those two countries. If you look around the rest of the world, there's about a million barrels of decreased production in other regions. So two and a half, maybe three million barrels of production are off the market. The world's consumption last year was 92 million barrels a day. Now we're up to 93 million barrels a day. So if a year ago we were oversupplied by two million barrels a day, we should be undersupplied by two million barrels a day. Right, Ryan? Well, that little Iran deal got done. And Iran has pushed an additional million barrels, give or take, on the market in that time, which, by the way, I did not call correctly. I thought they were not going to be able to push that much, but they are ramping up production. And there's a long way of saying those production and consumption lines are doing a lot of this right now, which is why we're still seeing people cautiously evaluate the oil business. But I'm here to tell you, when you look around the world at the levels of production and the levels of consumption, consumption continues to grow, production is stabilizing, all the fundamentals tell us oil prices have nowhere to go but up. One last data point on oil prices. If I were to go around the world and I were to show you the lift cost, which is basically the amount it takes to get a barrel out of the ground in an oil field, I went around the world and I showed you this really great graph and it said the price to produce, i.e. lift cost, how much oil could I produce break even at $45 a barrel? In other words, how many fields are economical at $45 a barrel? How much of that 93 million barrels can I produce? It's only about 65 million barrels. So right now at $45 a barrel, I didn't see what it is this morning, if we're at $45 a barrel, a good 25 to 30 million barrels are being produced, losing money. Once again, all the fundamentals point to oil prices coming up. So I believe we next year will see $60 a barrel very comfortably. 
And I expect to have a very positive impact on the entire Texas economy. My second prediction was that we would lift the crude oil export ban, which we did. Congress passed as a part of the budget proposal. Now it's been about six months ago, maybe four months ago, lifting the crude export ban. It, is at, it has been lifted and we have actually shipped as a nation a handful of barges overseas carrying great Texas light sweet crude. This is a good thing. A lot of people ask, well, Ryan, all right, doesn't that mean prices are gonna go up? No, it doesn't. Here's the thing about the crude oil export ban. And a lot of us have heard about this in the public domain. In order for the crude oil export ban to do a lot to lift up our local oil prices, there has to be someone overseas who really wants to get their hand on our oil who today can't get their hands on it. Well, the world today, unfortunately, is somewhat awash in light, sweet crude oil. As the Saudis have ramped up their production, they have put more light, sweet crude on the market. The Brent uh, British standard that WTI is often compared against is also a light, sweet blend. So when you look around the world, there's not a big demand today for light, sweet crude oil. However, fast forward, if you will, five, 10 years down the road. For those of us in the downstream business, we know that the light, sweet crude oil is easier to refine. It takes a less complex process. And so growing economies, places like China and India and Pakistan, are going to want to consume more and more of that product. So while the lifting the oil export ban doesn't help us a lot today, as we look five years down the road, we absolutely think it will. However, there may be something that we're doing right here at home that brings even more value than that. And that is... That takes me to our third point. Last year, I also predicted that the downstream segments of the market would continue to be strong. But right now, all of us who are in the downstream segment doing business with refineries and petrochemical companies know that margins right now are pretty slim. My guess is the other panels that have been here have been talking about those, that same condition. I will tell you, though, once again, all the fundamentals point a different direction. The reason most of us in the business believe that the margins have gotten so slim is basically one thing. You had this huge glut of oil. That oil has to move through the process, comes through the transportation and midstream, down through the refineries and eventually down to the petrochemical plants. And as it does that, it basically puts a lot of extra product on the market. Gasoline inventories are at an all-time high and that has depressed margins in the refineries and the chemical plants. You'll even hear, if you really pay attention like I do, that in refineries, some of them have, started, have already started switching away from their summer blend because there's so much excess gasoline in storage. Now, let me tell you the cool part, though, that I'm going to double down on my prediction. I believe that the U.S. is going to have its most prominent opportunities, not actually in oil production. It's going to be in the downstream side of the business. Here's why. Let's say you're Pakistan. And you think, man, I've got a growing energy economy. And even when my economy slows down, my per capita energy usage is going up because the more urbanized my population becomes, the more energy they use. All of us have been camping before. When you go out camping, you don't actually use all that much energy. You wake up when the sun comes up. You go to bed when the sun goes down. Sit around a fire at night. Don't use a lot of electricity. You go home at night on the weekends, you drive down the road, energy is used all over the place. So in places like China, India, and Pakistan, you've got this growing energy economy. Let's pick on Pakistan. Pakistan, if it wants to use more petrochemical products, wants to use more refined products, it's got a choice to make. One, I can have somebody come in and either drill some wells locally or in my local vicinity, i.e. Saudi Arabia, and then bring that crude oil over into my country, right? And look, at the end of the day, you drill a you know, pretty complex, deep, long horizontal well, you might spend 10, 15 million dollars. To a country, that's a rounding error. I can drill wells, I can get the oil. But then what do I do with it? You see, it's one thing to drill a 15 million dollar well. It's another to build a 300,000 barrel a day refinery. You go down to the Gulf Coast where we've got literally dozens along the Texas, Louisiana, even in the Mississippi uh, coastline. Dozens of these refineries. If you were Pakistan and said, I got to build a 300,000 barrel a day refinery. I need to come up with not a few 10, 15 million dollars. I got to come up with five, seven billion dollars. And I need 500 to 1,000 people that actually know how to run a refinery. That is a much bigger challenge. My wager is 
that the Pakistanis and others around the globe with these growing economies say, man, it would be a lot easier than trying to drill and process all that oil is just buy that stuff from the Americas. Those guys are good at it. Our refining and petrochemical infrastructure are also advantaged, by the way, in natural gas. We have a lot of oil in this country today. Our reserves are going up continuously as we do these evaluations, but they pale by comparison to our natural gas reserves. If I were to couple what we call proven reserves and technically recoverable reserves, two things that geeks in the market like me love to talk about. Couple those together. Ryan, how many years of natural gas do we have in the United States? Over a hundred. Over a hundred years of natural gas. And the fields like the Marcellus are producing that gas so prolifically that up there even today at $2.50 of BTU prices, people are still drilling. We in the United States are paying 25% for natural gas of what most other places around the world are paying. When you ask our refineries, you ask our petrochemical plants, what's your number two cost, either after feedstock or in addition to feedstock, they'll tell you it's energy, it's natural gas. So we've got the infrastructure, the existing facilities, we've got the cheap natural gas prices, and we've got the personnel already on the ground. I think that's where the opportunities are gonna come. Now, what makes it even better, though, is not just we have the facilities, we've got the oil. We have one other thing. And to tell you this, I've got to put this in perspective to, to, really, to really shape this story. Today, Texas has about 400,000 miles of pipeline. 400,000 miles of pipeline. And we went from about 300,000 miles to 400,000 miles over about the last 10 years. We built 100,000 miles of pipeline in 10 years. Is that a lot? Well, let me tell you a quick story. So I go down to Mexico about two months ago on my first official out-of-state business. So official state business, out-of-country, sorry, international. Go to Mexico, and I had several meetings over the course of my time in Mexico, all with public government officials, and they all want to talk about how we regulate. Look, you guys, they'll say, you guys are obviously leading in Texas. Tell me how you do this. And one of the meetings that I th found particularly interesting was with the group called Senegas, which is Mexico's pipeline regulatory group. So I sit down with these officials from Senegas and one of the guys from Senegas says, well, you know, Mr. Sitton, uh, in Mexico, we are going to double our pipeline capacity over the next 12 months. I thought, whoa, that's a pretty tall order. How much is that? He said, we're going to build 10,000, I'm sorry, not the next 12 months, over the next five years. We're gonna double our pipeline capacity next five years. Wow, okay. How much pipeline is that? It's about 6,000 miles. He says, have you ever, how do you manage that kind of growth? And now you heard the numbers I said about Texas, right? Unfortunately, the diplomat in me did not come out first, the engineer did. And I said, well, in Texas, we build like 10,000, well, he said 10,000 kilometers. We build 10,000 kilometers of pipeline like every six months. He was a little indignant at my response. I'm like, fine, arrogant Texan. The point was, we have so much expertise in developing this infrastructure, we can move product around this state like nobody in the world. If a new oil field or a new gas field is discovered and I need to move that product from that area to a refinery or a petrochemical plant or an export facility, we can do it. When you combine our existing oil and gas reserves, the technology and personnel we have, the transportation infrastructure and our refining infrastructure, we have an energy portfolio that is second to none around the world. Now, in case you're thinking, how much does this, I mean, does this politician really know about this stuff? Before I served in elected office, as uh, Steve said when he introduced me, I owned an oil and gas engineering firm, done business all over the world. I've actually been in Malaysia and Saudi Arabia. I've been in Oman, I've been in the UAE, I've been in Malaysia, I've been in China, I've been in South America, both Brazil and Argentina, I've been in Canada in the tar sands, uh, I've been in Scotland and several areas across Europe. I've seen these things firsthand and I've talked to these people firsthand. I'm here to tell you, everyone, just like I said a year ago, is watching what we're doing. 